Greetings, folks. Today, we are going to talk about reactants. Specifically, what we mean by that is how the current voltage characteristic of an inductor or a capacitor behaves. Now, let's start with a simple resistor. We know that the behavior of this, if I were to pass a current through it, is essentially controlled by Ohm's law, so that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. Now, it doesn't matter what the frequency or the shape of this AC waveform is, the resulting voltage, given a certain current, sort of mirrors it. It looks just like it. So if I have a current waveform you know, that looks like this, the voltage waveform is simply scaled by the value of R. So it might be bigger, it might be smaller, you know, but it's the same shape. And if we had maybe a, a more complicated waveform like we would get from you know, music or voice, well, let's just say we had some funky looking waveform like this, the same thing will be true. It always tracks it because R is just a proportional uh, value here. I'm just drawing it larger just so it's easier to see, okay? All right, the resistance itself is not a function of frequency. So if we were to plot the value of R versus F, right, that's just a straight line. Ideally, whether it's DC, a kilohertz, a megahertz, ideally, R doesn't change. In reality, there is, a, you know, less than ideal characteristic. But that's the hoped-for ideal, right, our perfect device. Now, when we take a look at an inductor, we also have a, uh, an equation, a characteristic equation for this, and that is the voltage is equal to L, the inductance times di dt, right, the rate of change of current flowing through it. So I say, you know, here's my current I. So the voltage might look like the input, you know, if it's a sinusoid, as we'll see in a sec, but ultimately the shape is the derivative of the input. So if we were to throw in a sine wave, now let's start with the same thing here. So here's the current. Now what's the shape of the voltage? It's the slope, right? Di dt is the rate of change, the slope, the steepness of that waveform. So if that's I, if the black over here is I, then my red here is gonna be the slope. So right, it's really steep here, so I'm gonna get a big number. It's really steep negative here, so I'm gonna get a big negative number. Here and here, we get zero, and the process repeats. And what we have is something that looks like this. It is, in fact, the cosine wave, right? So we can say that you know, that sine function turns into a cosine. Now, if we have a, um, a more interesting waveform, okay, you know, we don't get this simple thing, because after all, a cosine is just a, a sine wave that's leading by 90 degrees, right? We just take the, the wave and push it over 90 degrees, quarter of a cycle, and, you know, we have our sine wave. But if we had something a little bit more interesting, you know, suppose we have uh, like a triangle wave coming in here. Well, the, the derivative, the slope of this in this region is just some positive value, right? It's a fixed rate of change. And over here, it's the same value, assuming this is a symmetrical wave. It's the same value except it's negative. So that comes down like this. And then, you know, it reverses and repeats. Okay, and, and on we go. So the shape of this actually changes, right? It's, it's uh, quite unlike what we have over here with the resistor. That's interesting. Um, we can actually get our circuits to perform a little calculus for us if we really want to. But what I'm interested in right now is uh, sort of quantifying, coming up with an expression to describe what this sort of mutation from current into voltage is, right? What's the relationship? Here, we just know it's proportional to the value of R, okay? Well, this is our operational equation. So can I come up with something? Now, we, 
we know, you know, we learned this back in DC circuits, right? The resistance is just the voltage divided by the current. Well, by extension, we can talk about an AC voltage and an AC current for our inductor and also for a capacitor. Now, I'm going to call that X. So we can say that's V over I, the AC characteristics. And let's start with some current value, right? I'm going to put a current through my inductor. I'm going to say that's some peak value I times the sine of 2 pi FT. So there's some frequency F, some peak value I. So I need to find the derivative of this. What is the slope, right? We already know it's going to be a cosine wave. So di dt will in fact work out to i times 2 pi f times the cosine of 2 pi ft. Now we said that cosine is just a sine wave moved 90 degrees over. So another way of writing this is to say it's i 2 pi f times the cosine, excuse me, times the sine of 2 pi ft plus 90 degrees. So far so good? All right, so getting back to this guy, my uh, x value. So what is the voltage? I'm just going to stuff this into my equation over here and see what we come up with. So v would be L times this. In other words, it's L times 2 pi F sine 2 pi FT plus my 90 degrees. So the ratio of these two things, right? V over I tells me what this X is. So we just plug them in, right? I have L 2 pi f sine 2 pi f t plus 90 degrees. And I'm going to divide that by my current. Well, the current is I. Oops, I forgot my I. I forgot to carry through my I over here. I'm going to throw that in here. Sorry. All right, there's the I. And then I forgot to transpose it down here. Okay, two errors, human. Anyway, uh, my uh, value of current here is I times the sine of 2 pi ft. Okay, let's simplify this. Well, hey, those I's cancel out. Good thing I remembered. And what we wind up with is a value of 2 pi fl. And then... These signs, right, these are the same values, sine of 2 pi ft, 2 pi ft, except this has 90 degrees attached to it. So you can say that x is 2 pi fl at 90 degrees, okay? Or, as so we were talking about complex numbers before, the way we would say this is it's equal to j 2 pi fl. Okay, so x, x for this inductor, all right? we're going to call x sub l is equal to j 2 pi fl. Now that's in ohms, right? Because we have volts over amps here. So, yeah, ohms. However, you can't add these straight up with regular resistor ohms because these have an angle of 90 degrees, right? This, these are plus j's, and these are angles of zero. So you can't just add them, you know, as scalar values. We'll take a closer look at that shortly. But in any case, this equation is pretty important. Because if you now turn around and sort of repeat what we're doing over here, right? What happens if I look at X sub L versus frequency? Well, you know, for a given value of L, as F increases, X increases, right? So we get something that goes like this. Higher and higher frequency, higher and higher 
x of l is. You can almost, almost think of this as like a frequency dependent resistor, right? As the frequency goes up, the ohmic value goes up, but it's not a resistor because again, this is a plus j value. It's not, you know, resistance in the normal way. Sometimes to distinguish when you talk about magnitudes, we'll put little like absolutes around here or even double absolutes so that we know that, you know, we're talking about that number, right? X number of ohms, but there's really a J there. It's really at 90 degrees. Okay. All right. Now, if we did the same thing for a capacitor, okay, um, we would use the equation I is equal to C dB dt. And we would go through this same build. And what you would discover is that your X sub C would be equal to minus J 1 over 2 pi FC. So now we have a reciprocal arrangement. So for the capacitor, again, I'm going to use a magnitude on this. I mean, it's really going down, but just so I can compare it directly, um, we're going to be talking about X sub C over here, magnitude of it. What we would see here is as frequency goes up, X sub C gets smaller. So I see something that goes like this. Right, it dives down as frequency increases. So these are the ideal curves that you would get. All right. Now, in reality, you know, things are never quite so clean. You know, really low frequencies when we approach uh, DC, you can't ignore the coil resistance on this guy anymore. So what ends up happening is this sort of peels away at the low frequencies like this. And if we get to a high enough frequency, the distributed capacitance and the winding starts to kick in, and it's going to start going like that. So there is a, a range that it operates pretty well. Similar sort of situation here. You know, theoretically, if F was uh, zero hertz, you know, this thing would be approaching, as F approaches zero, this thing would be approaching infinity. But there is, of course, a, you know, a finite uh, leakage current going through the capacitor, so it's never going to be infinity. Likewise, if we go to, you know, crazy high frequency, this thing should be approaching zero. That's not going to happen either. There is uh, something called equivalent series resistance. Um, there's also small inductive values. So even though this thing would try to go to zero, theoretically, what will happen is eventually it'll start to come back up, all right? And this will depend partly on the uh, quality of the dielectric that we have in the capacitor. All right, now you combine this up, and here's what you can say. All right, so here's uh, a complex plane is what I'm drawing here, all right? So this is my real out here. This is true R. Coming up here is plus J. So this is plus J for like my X of L. And here's my minus J for X of C. So what we would say is, you know, a, a resistor looks like this. And an inductor looks like this. And a capacitor looks like this. All right. Well, what if we have a circuit that has all three of these things, or maybe two of them, you know, resistor and a capacitor, resistor and an inductor. You know, what do we do? Well, we basically are going to get some vector out here. All right. Um, some magnitude, some angle. And you could say that it has a resistive part and it has an imaginary part, right? An X value. And we're going to break those apart. And that's how we're going to deal with things. That is called impedance. Z. And that's going to be the subject of the very next video. But before we go, there's one other little detail I want to add in here. And that is just like resistance has its, uh, its flip, its reciprocal, right? Conductance, 1 over G. The same thing is true with reactance. The flip for reactance is called susceptance, 1 over B, okay? So susceptance is to conductance as reactance is to resistance. So we might use a susceptance if we have, you know, like parallel combinations and things like that. Um, what's the flip of impedance Z? It's called admittance Y. So Z is equal to one over Y. Okay. All right. So we're going to pick up 
talking about impedance in the next video.